Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 263. Whew. And yes, your eyes do not deceive you. That is the illustrious, the one and only, the incomparable Mr. Edward St. Ange, who devastatedly, dashingly went over and impressed the Canadian world with his prowess, <laughs> his insight, oh, his God. forbearance uh, as to strategies and inside trader te techniques, so forth. Oh, 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 we just got a little bit on the lower scale of things. Uh, Mr. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. I heard you talking about strategy and insight, and I knew instantly it wouldn't be anything that you were doing, Lauren. So I <laughs> not even close. <laughs> not blind pig and for looking for a turnip. That's me. Also with us, Mr. Dean Schmidt, with the capabilities of meta search that are unknown to normal mortals, uh, capable of going over and determining the exact nuance of what exactly to do at just the right moment with powerful tools such as meta search and all those platforms, which actually our first topic is going to be a little bit about MetaSearch in a strange, awesome. convoluted way. But Mr. Dean with Basecamp MetaSearch, and then the really cool second side that I still haven't got a name for. <laughs> it's so easy. It's so easy. MetaSearchMarketing.com. <laughs> for some reason, you know me in names, you know me in just roadblock. <laughs> and of course, we would not be complete without the other side of the pond, the people that are the true driving force of all that's good in the world, uh, from three and six. Well, yeah, <laughs> he's not here yet. Ben Don't up. worry, he's here. He is here. He is here. He is here. <laughs> you know, unlike the candy, man, you say my name three times on any kind of webinar, and I'll appear. It Don't is, worry. but you're not wearing the striped suit. It's the only thing that bothers me. It's I can get like, changed, Lord, if you need me to. I get changed. <laughs> I was thinking more Beetlejuice. You know, that's probably more your style. <laughs> Mr. Jonathan Hayward and Mr. Ben Hanley, the incomparable <laughs> three and six, um, which, you know, they are, what, I, the, the model that I love is the fact that you do it right with the, 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 the digital marketing without the BS. Digital or, without dishonesty. Dishonesty, yes, or BS. I'm going to make you yeah. get that tattooed because it's becoming a bit of a Katija thing and that you can never quite remember how to say it, but we well, can. I mean, that's Lauren. <laughs> 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 I, I don't even know Dean's second company name, and it's the it's the easier one of the two. Come on, I mean, <laughs> Basecamp Meta and Meta Search. Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> I'm not alone in this. MetaSearchMarketing.com. <laughs> there you go. MetaSearchMarketing.com. And Basecamp you're a better man than me. Oh, that makes a ton of sense. I was going to MetaSearchMightyMouse.com, and I just thought it was strange. Hey, you I, know, I actually might remember if it was Mighty Mouse. Mouse. You're right. You're right. Just, we won't judge. <laughs> All those in favor of a rebrand for Dean. <laughs> I'll be sure to get that domain and redirect it. I'm fairly certain the Mighty Mouse trademark has probably expired. So, because <laughs> that's the only problem with that domain. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> None else I can think of at the particular nope. moment of this. Um, actually, in a strange way, I, I did for for I, I'm, I'm stealing Tim's suggestion for our first topic, which is Google and its handling of Trivago. And interestingly, Ed and I see it slightly different, but I, I agree with Ed. I know, yeah, right? Go figure, right? Me disagree with Ed. Uh, <laughs> and then the sky is blue and the sun rotates. No. Um, <laughs> Whoa! Hey, Tammy! Hey, Tammy! Hey. Finally, some intelligence on the show. Good God, we needed it. <laughs> Where? <laughs> We're about ready to jump on to the topic that Tim threw back as a response to um, the email that went out as to um, Google and how it's been handling its uh, uh, Travago relationships and so forth as to past due billing. And uh, Dean, you're great at this because you know the insides of all this because Ed brought up a very interesting point to this. We don't know the whole story. Yeah. We just see what's being broadcasted as to, oh, all of a sudden Google turned into a mm, and is demanding that these companies like them Right. Stand up and, 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 and so my point in. here is, is in our own personal experience as part of yeah. what we were going through and preparing to help our clients with. I mean, we went to all of our biggest cost centers and said, hey, you know, this is who we serve. This is what we pay you. Is there any consideration? And I got to be honest with you. Google was one of the first ones to respond positively and fairly. Um, so, I mean. You do have to. Yeah, but that was of... okay. Now, to put timelines to this, that was early on when Google didn't see its negative impact on its revenues. Mm. Right. So, you know, there, there are a few things here. First of all, all of the companies involved in this quarrel are massive, heavily funded companies. They are not small businesses. Um, and, you know, if you have a billion dollar market cap, 
you have access to other means of keeping yourself afloat, uh, including public debt markets. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't see Google, like it, this article and this story was very slanted to, you know, Google being big and bad and a monopoly. But I gotta tell you, at least in my experience, Google blew me away at how they treated small business, at least my small business in, in this, uh, uh, this climate. Um, I mean, they were, they, hell, they were better than my landlord at responding to me. Yeah, you did have a bad experience. Yeah, you still owe me money for that, Ed. You still owe me money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I want to, I want to start putting a stick in the sand as to a benchmark on some things. But I'm telling you, it's great that you're here with this because I was going to include milestone in this anyway. Um, there, one of the shining lights out of what we're going through and have been going through so far is this surgence of collaboration between what was competitors, um, our, our, our industry, there have been some very shining, uh, positive shining examples of companies that have stepped up, Ed, yours, Tammy, yours, uh, uh, I'll call out stewards, he's not even here. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna go negative on anybody else, but I will say that you, everybody, Lauren, the collaboration. Lauren, Tristan, yeah. Ben. Tristan, <laughs> Ben. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And, 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 and I'm sure Dean gave some pretty solid advice to a lot of people to get a paycheck for those either. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's been this amazing surge of let's what can we do to help okay how can we work together how can we share stuff and it wasn't like kind of gentle share it's like here's my deck here's my here's my stuff what 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 do you need how can i help i mean tammy you guys have worked in, in ways with fuel travel that would have been that you know eight months ago we'd be like what <laughs> yeah. you know you guys are collaborating in data content share abilities how can we help this is what we can do what can you do there are other companies, uh, nameless, because I just don't want to go over and have them chase me down later, that have been real pains in the ass, that have that have been billing for stuff they weren't even doing, that were charging for stuff they wouldn't shut off, and they just kept rolling out the invoices. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting there going, huh. You know, so I, I know what you're saying with Google the early on, because you even pointed them out months ago when we were talking about all this, like we are now. Like, hey, they stepped up and helped and so forth, and compared to your landlord who told you, you know, screw you, send me the check. Um, you know, yes, to that point, and we don't know the whole story with Travagos and so forth, but I, I'm leaning into the idea of this is a chance to put the dagger in on some of these third parties that Google doesn't want to be competing with so directly against anyone. Or, or perhaps think, Google looked at the landscape of who needed help and decided that companies north of a billion dollars in valuation with tons of capital, maybe they don't need as much help. I don't think it was just that. I, I, th I think you, you're pr perhaps right with that, Ed. Um, I, but I don't think it's just the big, the big, um, you know, uh, megaliths out there. I think they've done it on a, a case by case basis because we were in that situation with a previous company and we know that the, um, they, they perhaps weren't so generous um, from, from the get go, although they were working with uh, certainly, certainly trying to work collaboratively, but it wasn't all, oh, everything's gone wrong. Yeah, let us help you out. It was, well, hang on a second. You've not done this as well. So there's, there's, a, there's a, bit of a, a bit of a give and take with that. Right, but, yeah. but even that's fair. Yeah. Um, oh, no, you know, I, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying it's not I would, fair. I would find yeah. that akin to, you know, there are multiple hotels that I know of that have thrived through this whole thing, believe it or mm. not, um, who are ahead of their mm. year. Um, I would be offended if one of them came to me and, and said, hey, we need financial help because I'm aware that they're more profitable this year than they were last year. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I don't fault. And listen, I'm not a pro Google guy at all, um, but I also don't fault them for wanting to make sure that, you know, everything's fair in what they're doing. And if you are... If you've been a bad customer, if you haven't paid your bills consistently throughout your history, if there have been other things uh, yeah. about you, I'm not yeah. mad at a company like Google saying, I'm sorry, like, you know. Well, Ed, you just well, hit on to me what's the big missing piece in this article, right? How past, I mean, was this, they owed it that much in the normal course of billings, right? If their billings were net 30 and they got billed and, and it was just within those 30 days, or were they consistently late and you know a good six months past due, right? Because the from a 
company perspective, I'm going to be more willing to work with someone that comes to me who is right. I mean, let's let's be. Real. I'm sorry, I'm laughing sorry, at sorry, a, I'm, I'm laughing at Stewart's uh, comment of no. "little pig, little pig, let me in." <laughs> yeah, no, I think that a few people have Yes, that's okay. Sorry, I, I, sorry, Tommy. I, 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 sorry, Tammy. I, I, something. Uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> The big bad wolf. Sorry, Tammy, for interrupting. Yeah, yeah, it's totally cool. Um, but I, but as I said, I think you've been out, right? How and, and none of us know. We we can speculate, but if they were six months past due on their bills, I can't fault Google for saying that. Like yeah. that's that's all before this. Well, at this point, it's not. But in March, if they were three to six months past due, that was pre-COVID, pre all mm -hmm. of this. It's a very different scenario to me for someone to come to help and say, hey, I need help for a couple months and it's going down versus, um, like you said, someone that's incredibly profitable and doing even better. Hey, I need, you know, some concessions. Well, well let's, keep in mind that, let's keep in mind that these are the same OTAs that for years now have been really bashing Google saying, well, you're competing with us and you're not treating us fair. I mean, these OTAs haven't been exactly kind to Google over the years either. And for many years now in the meta search landscape, they've all been talking about how, oh, we're going to pull back our meta search spend. Booking.com was going to stop spending on meta search. It never happened. Okay. Now, you, you pull up any hotel out there, pull up the most obscure hotel you can think of. I mean, not a five room roadside inn, but you know, a, a very general hotel, pull it up on Google, Look at their Google hotel ad. You're going to see somebody advertising on there. They have never run out of people to advertise on there. During COVID, it did shrink. And, and you could start getting them at a really cheap CPC, but they never ran out. It was never yeah. vacant. Right. Yeah, this is complex, right? And it, there's multiple villains. It's like one of those movies where you're never quite sure who the bad guy is. But I, I would say it's ironic to me that OTAs are accusing... Google of suckling at the teeth of the hospitality industry for years, right? That that was kind of the accusations. Like you're making a that ton is of the money pot. Off. That is the pot calling the kettle black. Exactly. Never right. ever, ever so happened. So you know, uh, there's a lot of OTAs out there that have made a lot of money with this, this shell game of bidding on a, a brand's name, like an a, a independent hotel brand name, in in bidding on those keywords paying Google because they know they'll make a little bit more than they're paying Google. But the margin, it's the, the profits in the margins, and they've done this at the expense of the hotel. So so there's a narrative here that people are looking for a bad actor and, and say, and Google's an easy mark for that, right? It's easy to say, Google, you're, you're terrible, you're evil, and it plays into this fear that they're becoming this massive monopoly. But the OTAs are leveraging that to their own advantage. And let's not forget, like, although, I'm a fan of OTAs in concept. They're not innocent in this. They, they've done a lot of things that aren't in the interest of the hospitality industry, and especially are not in the interest of the individual hotels. So I, I don't want people just to read a headline that Google's screwing people with billing and, and jump on that bandwagon, because that's really not what's happening here. It's OTAs that are poorly planned and over leveraged so that when the pandemic hit, they're like, oh, crap, we can't keep milking these things the way we have for years. And and by the way, for large companies like that, milking credit terms is common business practice. I mean, for yes. a long time, it was a well-known joke that Disney was, you know, years behind on payment to uh, their electric bill and their basic utilities uh, here in, in Orlando. So... <laughs> Yeah, and it's you know. amount to, to check kiting, right? It, it's it's no different than using someone else's um, good favor for your own financial gain. And, right. and so at well, some well, point well, that well, bites you in the butt and that, that time COVID. is when there's a pandemic and revenue yeah. starts coming in. Yeah, you're absolutely COVID has exposed so many poor business practices. Yep. That's why you get, you know, you, you can see where there's just absolutely, there's either nothing left in the coffers or the way they've been working, or even worse, that when there are things left in the coffers, but you don't want to spend it on the things that are important, you just want to keep that money for yourself. Mm -hmm. And there are definitely some bad actors out there, um, not just in the hospitality industry as well, I hasten to add. Yeah, yeah. This, this has happened, uh, happened everywhere, but there's definitely some bad actors out there that really do need to get When the caught. tide goes out, you find out who's swimming naked. 
Edna no, but normally great. Lauren. It's normally <laughs> Lauren, but that's just a fun. <laughs> hey. No use of clothes. Yep, good. Um, <laughs> oh, the last call, so, so I mean, yeah. you know, like I'm, I'm glad we're we're looking at this reasonably and not just doing the easy thing and making Google out to be the villain. Because I got to be uh-huh. honest with you, uh, it sounds like a bunch of villains fighting over, you know, who's who's the worst criminal is really what this article felt like. Yes, that I, that I completely agree with. Yeah, yeah. and, and Google, Google, Google not with. Yeah. Yeah, Google are not blameless in this. I, well, not right. with this, but in general, Google are very much about the money. We just, you just need to look at their platform and how they will, they will casually bring, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, like the, a simple little button that will be hidden under, di- you know, layers and layers of different ways of finding it that will make them a tremendously large amount of money if you don't flick that from um, on to off. Yeah. Or they'll have their premium partners, um, uh, you know, that. We've had a, a direct example of this where they're saying, we're scoring you. You are our customer. We're scoring you against all of our other customers. And if you're not a good little customer, we'll take the toys away from you. Alan, can, you imagine walking yeah. into, can you imagine walking into a department store and they're saying, uh, sorry, can I just check what's in your wallet, please? And what's your credit rating? Really sorry, the guy next to you had more money. Do you mind waiting at the back of the queue? It's like saying if you don't buy as much as the guy next to you, you don't get a plastic bag. You sort of have to carry it in your hands and walk like the walk of shame out the side exit. I don't think Google is blameless in this at all. And and here's what it boils down for me. For years, for years, they've been lax. Oh, guys, spend 90 days, have 100 days payment terms. Pay as when you want. Like next time we hook up, you just pay me. Like beans, coin, I don't care. Now it's coming home to roost. And now all of a sudden they're like, People are saying, oh, these great payment terms you gave us, could you extend them a little bit longer now that society is collapsing? And they've just turned around and go, no. And in the article, you can see they just... Which, they which by the that. way, I mean, granted, Google is could be better about that. But at the same time, when you're overly dependent on a company that has made it clear for years that they're trying to eliminate you, it's probably a bad idea to get into really bad credit terms with that organization. Absolutely um, agree. In that specific instance, yeah, with the, with the relationship between the two of them, yeah, it's becoming beholden, becoming be- reliant on your enemy for your success, and you know that he or she is trying to really slowly kill you. Right. And you're trying to really slowly fight back, but you're right. massively outnumbered, and you owe them a hundred million. Well, we, we saw we saw it happen when the first PPP rolled out. The large companies snarfed it up because they had the lawyers that knew how to do the dance yeah. to get the product in front of everybody else and get money to companies that then we probably only saw the, the smallest of tips of icebergs of all the big companies that got money unjustifiably because they were the first in line mm-hmm. to your point Ben. it's like yeah. they walked in the door first i had the more money i know how to process things i'm going to be treated differently and i'm going to yeah. get money that i don't even need but because i'm a big company have the ability to grab and before anybody else can figure out how to do it but i, I do I, the reason why i point out is like i also think that google is not blind to the fact this is a chance to restructure the landscape mm-hmm. well, so, it could know. be an accelerator right yeah. it could be an accelerator for what their ultimate evil plan is to take right. more of the market share and yes they, they, they did that. Well, we <laughs> also have to understand it's a risk they take um because if they overreach here they open a door for amazon to be able to slide in and go, hey, Expedia and you know whoever else is, Buddy. You know, let, come let, us, oh. let us help you out. We also have these consumers. Here's here's what we'll do for you. Uh, you, you need some advertising. <gasps> well, the, 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 risk, <laughs> the, the risk is also outside of travel, right? We've already got a lot of antitrust conversation going on, especially in Europe. And this could really force America to jump on that bandwagon. America's already started. I mean, Congress has already started yeah. questioning Google. Right. They started and... having conversations, but they have so much lobbying that that's, it's not really going anywhere yet. But this could be what pushes it over to, to where, yeah. where there's a but real I... chance Google gets broken up. And, and so the game they're, not, they're playing is not just hospitality. Because forget, forget what Ben just said about uh, them being your enemy and, and that. Regardless, you should never put all your eggs in one basket, right? You, all of your business should not come from one source. You've got to diversify. So if, if that one source is Google, 
and, and you're in multiple industries and it's Google, Google, Google. Now that gets split up. Google's going to be in trouble if they then have to split up their travel division from their other divisions. You know, sure. So, I mean, but I will yeah. also tell you, I don't envision the U.S. being the leader at breaking up any of these U.S. based no, they conglomerates that own entire swaths of the world's Internet. It won't because be. Because breaking up Google is akin to handing power of the internet over to other countries mm -hmm. uh, where it's currently, you know, squarely housed in a U.S. based company. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't think you'll see the U.S. doing it. I, I, I really don't. Um, that and, of course, you know, Google owns probably half our politicians, as does <laughs> Apple and Facebook and, you know, all these other Goliath. And that's not even apps. possible. Our politicians are so smart. They know that when they walk from one side of the room <laughs> to the other side of the room, they just know how stop. that shit works. <laughs> just that. <laughs> but to, to your point, Stuart, you mentioned about um, – Google's move on the hospitality or potential move, they already did that with, with Meta by, by dropping their commission, or, or, sorry, opening up Meta Search to a commission only product. Yep. That, that, was, that, was a, that was a big, big move there because you know, it, it's essentially making it an OTA. They, yep. they, they are offering Meta Search in an OTA style model. Yeah. So, but in a more so, friendly way for the for the hotel because the hotel gets the, the data. Which, which makes is, Google yeah. criminal for being good to the smaller underlying business. And <laughs> not, yeah. No, but it's a risk for the Wall smaller Street. businesses because they're going to go all in on Google mm -hmm. and, and that becomes a problem because they but make a great opportunity now to make money. But once you're beholden to one distributor, they control the market. They control the price. They can yeah, but, but, but we're lucky though because there are other channels out there that are very, very squeaky clean and put you at the forefront, like Facebook. Oh wait! <laughs> oh, hang on. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to be back or you bit. can just go all in on Bing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you joke, man. Bing is getting a I good. Think, I think Bing. I think AOL. Bing AOL, AOL works, still man. has AOL still has like eight million paying subscribers. So okay, <laughs> Bing is the gill. Of search engines, <laughs> Gil from The Simpsons is is being personified. God, oh, I gotta get a search query. Nice. Oh, Gil's really gotta do this. That is who I feel Bing is. It, it does work well. It doesn't have volume, but it does work well. <laughs> it does work well. Yeah. I'm so pleased I'm here in time for the Simpsons reference. <laughs> <laughs> not wanting to not wanting to white knight Google here, but let's not forget that they very generously gave out some advertising credits to small businesses to help them get through this so not the biggest fan had some quite interesting rounds with google where we overtly claimed they were telling us to do something to hit there and i believe the phrase was quarterly bonus tris if i'm not okay mistaken. I, that just came out I okay mean, so yeah. not the biggest fan but we can look we can't overlook at what yeah. they've done and and i'm also just i find it really hard to feel bad for companies who, you know, CEOs make millions of dollars a year and their, you know, corporate spend accounts have been fat and crazy. But, but, and Ed, but Ed, you're forgetting they, they saw a decrease year over year for the first quarter in the history of their company over right. the last years. You know, you've got to feel bad. Like they're down, <laughs> yeah. They're down two whole percent year over year. You know, I mean, and, 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 you know, I feel, island? I feel like by the island. island. Right. I feel so horrible, you know, especially when, you know, there are giant greedy companies like we have a, uh, a grocery store chain down here that, you know, is so reckless that, you know, their employees primarily own the company and they're sitting on a $12 billion cash pile to make sure that their future is safe. Those companies are horrible. Instead, <laughs> you should just be paying it all out to your top executives and to your investors uh, and and not at all caring about you know preparing for potential bad times. Mm. The well, president what, of Flip Two was heard to say. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I would say though that if if you if you do feel compelled in any way to to stand up to the, these big people, uh, these big companies, you know, if Google's one of them or whatever, I suggest that what you do that whenever you visit them, you steal as many Google related products as you can possibly get <laughs> hands on. Oh, <laughs> Ben, you, you've still got some Legos, haven't you? <laughs> Sorry, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you paid for those one way or another. Or yeah, you, uh, yeah, yeah. They weren't free. Were free. <laughs> they were free. I think Lauren and I have both self-professed ourselves as being tchotchke whores 
You know, if you oh, go, yeah. To, oh, yeah. we go but, to a high tech or something behind like me. That. Wait a minute, hold on, see if we can do it. So, that's just yeah. one shelf of goodies. <laughs> I, I love the free T-shirts, man. <laughs> the T-shirts. Well, the sentence was not about information. It was about what you got. <laughs> Talking of T-shirts, Stuart, are you wearing an Adelaide United um, Australian football top there? Is that, is that what it is? That's yep. pretty close. I, I feel like they ripped off a, a certain Premier League team that is uh, <laughs> finally the, back in the Champions League. Hey, um, uh, to throw just a different topic out in conversation, IHG and ACOR, the buzz around the possibility. It's a core. It's a core. ACOR. It's a core. It's a core. <laughs> Wait, what's the other word I like using? Wait, what's the other word I like using? Paradium. Paradium. Yeah, paradium. The paradium of yeah, ACOR. Okay. ACOR. Okay. <laughs> <A-core. laughs> it's a core. It's like a hole. No, why do they always look at me weird when I spoke at their conferences? <laughs> Yeah, they're right up there with Hilton and Mario. Let the record show at uh, 25 minutes that we just descended into. <laughs> it's anarchy. We descended into it's anarchy. anarchy yeah. here. So, to the actual it's topic, a, that it's anarchy. About. <laughs> we were on yeah. the rails until Lele showed up. When Lele showed up, <laughs> I know I'm, I'm losing my reputation. Okay, see, rain it in, guys. Rain see, it in. You, you have read Lauren's dictionary. This is Lauren's dictionary. <laughs> Um, it's very short. That I, I'm, it's not I'm, very thick, but it's got a lot of special words. I'm not yeah. shocked that Acor and uh, <laughs> IHG, uh, or is it? Uh, <laughs> is that how you would say? Sell it, like bar rats. <laughs> Um, are are looking actually? I think they make a lot of sense from a merger yeah. perspective based on their brand footprints. Um, you know, they make a ton of sense, and they, uh, you know. It, I, I'm not mad at the idea of that merger. I think it's a good merger. I actually agree. I think that the the portfolios are really complementary, especially with some of the kind of higher end, more boutique brands that IHG has picked up in recent years. Mm-hmm. I think that that probably created a bridge that actually made a core interested in them in the first place. Because of course, if they were all Holiday Inns, it might not be as you know appetizing for them, but. I think this will bring also a little bit more diversity to a chorus portfolio as well. Yeah, quite a bit. It fills a lot of gaps. I actually yeah. think this merger makes more sense than Starwood Marriott. Mm. Yeah. Very complimentary for sure. It'll be interesting from a tech point of view, obviously bring it to round to like a digital marketing role here. There's going to be a tremendous amount of work that them guys are going to have to do with, with the diversity of portfolios they got. And I know a core are quite tech centric in any case. Yeah. Well, and so, you know, the, the potential big loser here is Amadeus mm. who have invested an incredible amount of effort and have made acquisitions because of IHG. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I, but I, I gotta tell you from a portfolio perspective, I think it makes sense. Um, and I, and I think there's going to be a lot of interesting, you know, mixes of mergers, but I also think, I still think you're going to see either Marriott or Hilton, um, sell off a brand or two. I, I just for for capital raise purposes. Are you in the market? Oh, Ed? Is that- there's Omni. Yeah. I mean, there's a, and I'm, I'm, I'm using Rob. By the way, Robert Cole did send out a great list again this week, and thank you, Robert, for doing that. But he uh, Omni selling off a few of their properties is one of the topics he threw into that conversation. They were going to get rid of uh, possibly five hotels. I think is one of these. Here, let me grab it and throw it in there. Yeah, but again, an Omni Hyatt merger. Well, I think an Omni Hyatt merger um, on paper makes sense. However, it further puts them into a short-term issue. Both of those companies are so dependent on large-scale convention and group. Um, Like, I think you need to see an Omni get folded into a strong leisure brand um, to to help balance, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the problems that are going to exist for the next year or two in group. Sorry, uh, just to, to, to pick up on that, it's actually leisure, not leisure. Oh, leisure. <laughs> just, just leisure. leisure. <laughs> a core. And, and a, a core. A core. Just a keep core. In there. <laughs> I don't know if you mentioned it before, but I'm fascinated by Choice Hotels adding on 
uh, 50 luxury, all-inclusive resorts. I think it's smart. I, I mean, I, the I, Choice Hotels, I interestingly brilliant. enough, is you know very similar in uh, product volume to the types of products that underpin Hilton and, and Marriott, but Hilton and Marriott, because of their premium offerings, we picture in our head the premium offerings, not the Hampton Inns and the Homewood Suites that basically make up the majority of their portfolio. Um, now, it, it's a, what's amazing to me, Adele, is I barely understood you because of this deep Southern accent you've developed. <laughs> <laughs> I lived 10 years in Texas from when I was 16 to 26. So I will be fixing and yawning too and fixing <laughs> in time now. It's going to be a light switch. <laughs> Are you um, okay in the South? <laughs> I, I woke up the second morning here in, uh, in South Carolina and I think I've landed in heaven. Well, it looks good on you. You're radiant tonight. That's right. That's right. Y'all. Y'all. <laughs> Guys, I'm, I'm going to drop off. I'm really sorry to only briefly make a, an appearance here, but uh, everybody have a great weekend. And, Chris, it was uh, great seeing you as always. Please, please pick on Ben as much as you possibly want. Okay? <laughs> Thanks, oh, thank you. Done and done. <laughs> I'm mean, I right, well. too. I just had a contract to show up. I'm trying to fix some things in my house that I'm trying to sell. So I might be. Oh, you're, you're still trying to sell that 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 house that is uh, falling through a sinkhole in a sand pit, and you're trying yeah. to tell them that it's all good. Or? <laughs> yeah. Is that the one with the neighbors? The really, really, really weird really neighbors, nasty neighbors and the planes that keep flying over? Is that the house? Just hang <laughs> up, Stuart. You ain't going to win this one, buddy. Gotcha. <laughs> what Stuart's not telling you is the contractor's just to fill the sinkhole with water and they're putting koi in it and they're going to say that it's a feature. Hey, that's, that's how we make pools in South Carolina. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Richard had an interesting comment. Is with, with Fuel Travel, Fuel Travel is the preeminent podcaster of the entire hospitality universe. They're award-winning. They're, they're incredibly intelligent and capable of tons of stuff and they do great surveys for consumer sentiment and they have an amazing pl product that uh, allows for uh, touchless keyless entry into rooms and cool uh, platforms that are GDPR compliant and, and really have some pretty cool stuff. So you can always go to fieldtravel.com slash podcast. Thanks for the plug, buddy. All right, I might be back on a little bit. Thanks, right, guys. We hope to see you back. <laughs> Bye, Stuart. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it is an interesting comment of, you know, would uh, would owners sue Marriott for selling a brand? Um, so I don't think that you're going to see Marriott sell a brand for the brand to sit on its own. But I, I would not be surprised. Um, let's not forget the last time there was a major financial crisis. Blackstone came in um, and uh, meddled quite a bit in some pretty large brands uh, and made a ton of money off of doing it. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they're not already looking at, you know, potential interesting portfolios to, to piece together, uh, which would include divesting a, uh, you know, a couple of brands off of some of these bigger kind of spread out brands. If you're a remaining owner of that, you shouldn't sue Marriott for that because that means Marriott's distribution capabilities are now more focused on the properties that are left instead of, you know, also being spread out to whatever brands they divest. And honestly, if you're one of the brands being divested, I would only sue if it was a bad plan. But I got to be honest with you, if I was a, a franchise holder of a brand that Blackstone was looking to buy, I would just go look at what they did in the last kind of, you know, spin that they did. They, they, they're really good at this type of stuff. Well, I'd also say which brand in particular, if it's a, if it's a, 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 an emerging brand that doesn't have a strong presence that just really didn't catch, aka, you know, I wouldn't even say a loft or anything like that, just, but just in general. Oh, so or, they're a loft to you, but a core is a core. <laughs> I mean, help me understand. It's, it's, it, there is no logic to my, my language. There is, they're not, they're they're not, not a an loft. Uh, unless there's a C. When you add the C, then you know it's kind of like the right. Yeah, and then you carry the you carry the two and you yeah. add five, and it makes forty two, which is the answer to the right. universe. But it, it, it's not really complex; it's just kind of <laughs> convoluted. No, the the idea of which brand would be in that sense, uh, to Richard's point of you know Fairfield. Well, does it have a strong enough scent, uh, uh, identity on its own to be different? Right now, my perception of the way the brands are handling themselves, any brand that wants to fracture off and be itself and have its own ability to help itself. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> I mean, they're trying to they're trying to juggle too many balls in the air at one time, I think. 
and they're not able oh, to maintain. I think, there are, I think there are brands that could use stronger identities inside some of these portfolios, like in Aloft. I think Aloft is a brilliant brand uh, that has been underdeveloped, um, mainly because it was a emerging brand for Starwood uh, prior to the the Marriott uh, acquisition, and I don't think Marriott has seen as much value in Aloft as Starwood did. Um, but I think the product itself is really interesting and and could have legs as a standalone, right. uh, you know, offering. Um, that being said, Richard's also pointing out, which, by the way, Richard, if you want to join the show, you can. Yeah, you can pop in if you want to, Richard. This is right um, up your alley with everything you know about Marriott, that's for sure. But the fact that Marriott and Hilton are primarily franchise companies now actually makes it possible. So in old times, you would have seen around this time Marriott and Hilton doing exactly what Omni is doing, where they would be divesting some of their real estate assets to free up capital to be able to continue to operate through this time. They don't have that lever to pull now. And so, you know, what lever do they have to pull? Well, they can raise debt, which Marriott did, um, you know, but you can only raise so much debt on a franchise system that's dependent on franchise fees. So what's next? What if they need more? And if they need more, selling off a portfolio of brands uh, to a company like Blackstone uh, makes complete sense. It's, and, and I think it's likely to happen. What do you guys think about the possibility of just a completely new brand emerging out of this that speaks to all the issues that we've been having with Airbnb? Like I know there's some in city centers where they split between residential and hotel rooms already, but usually they're owned separately. I wonder if we'll see some brands saying, you know what, it makes sense to maybe lower our room count, combine two rooms, add in a kitchen and have like an extended stay element where it's not necessarily an extended stay hotel, but they have sort of apartments available as well. So um, like a, like a domeo. It's like a mixed, like a domeo, yeah, yeah. But mixed yeah. use. So they've got the hotel floors and they've got the residential floors within one building. If it seems like that would be great for some of these big full service concepts in areas where there's more residential needed perhaps, and then they can change some of their meeting space into an expanded you know, gym or a salon or something like that. So it becomes, it, it kind of answers both questions and they have more flexibility to attract a different portfolio of guests. I think you're more likely to see a hotel convert to a timeshare than you are to see it convert to what you're talking about. And part of the reason for that is a lot of the places that would need the residential housing, uh, that need is changing. There is a massive migration happening. Uh, right now, where people are leaving dense city centers for less dense areas. Um, so, you know, where probably at the beginning, at the front edge of this, I was like, oh, man, New York hotels, no big deal. You know, pull the hotel flag off of it, turn it into residential or turn it into something else. You'll you'll get as much out of the asset. <laughs> now you kind of look at it and you look at what's happening. And I live in one of the areas that's getting a huge influx. Florida. Um, had record months these last two months on home sales, even with the fact that inventory is so low. We right. have less than, we have less than, as a state, we have less than 30 days of home inventory on the market. Mm -hmm. It's the first time that I can remember that that was ever the case. Um, and, and, you know, so, and most of that is people migrating into Florida from denser city centers. You're seeing the same thing happen with Silicon Valley with all these companies talking about, hey, part of the workforce is going to be able to go permanently remote. You can live wherever you want. Um, why stay in San Francisco when you could literally move? Why stay in New York? You live in South Carolina. Right. Like a <laughs> But but I, I mean, but a hotelier in uh, Australia, and their plan is to create a ho boutique hotel brand, taking floors off of apartment buildings in cities where they may have lost some uh, residents, and taking those rooms off their hands and turning it into. Uh, you know, vacation apartment rentals. Yeah. Well, in, in, in Australia, service departments uh, is a very common business. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the, like, you look at companies like uh, Meriton 
uh, which are these skyscrapers of mixed use residential and service apartments, which are basically hotels. Um, that's a that's a very common model out there. Um, and it's quite interesting. It hasn't really caught on as much here because in in Australia, I would say if you actually went during county, uh, service departments make up, you know, a, a pretty substantial amount of the inventory in some of these cities in Australia. Mm. Well, I would say if you can get great service and have some sort of a concierge uh, service element added to it so that you would have somebody to guide you to all the great places and help you take care of any needs you have would seem a great option. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think you are going to see creativity in the real estate asset. Um, because I think you're going to see there's there's not going to be a choice uh, otherwise um, in certain markets. In other markets, I worry, like Orlando. You know, I think about the the Hyatt right across from the convention center. What the heck are they going to do? Because there's not enough leisure demand to fill a hotel like that right now. I mean, there's, uh, you know, and and the business demand is looking so bad that even Universal decided to shut down two of their properties that are more focused on the business uh, stay. Um, you know, so if Universal's not seeing enough leisure demand to push leisure travelers into their own business hotels, uh, what what is that going to mean for that Hyatt? And there is no other use for that Hyatt. Like that, like no one wants to live where that Hyatt is. No one <laughs> yeah, at all. Um, and, and no one could afford to because the, the price per square foot that that would need to be would be, you know, 20 times the most expensive price per square foot of any other, you know, available real estate in the market. So I look at areas like that and I'm like, man, what's going to happen? It's going to just have to change hands. It's going to have to probably go to the bank and it's going to then, you know, get sold to someone else. Like, and, and I fear the same thing in Vegas. You know, those Vegas, you know, properties, there's not really a, an alternative use, uh, at least in like downtown Atlanta or in New York City or in Philadelphia or San Francisco. There is other need for the real estate because there is a constriction on, you know, land and, you know, available real estate. Uh, but in markets like Orlando, um, I, I, I worry about what's going to happen uh, with those buildings. I'm, I'm kind of sorting through some of the stuff that Robert sent over for because it kind of goes to a theme Ed, that you and I were talking about with the um, HSMAI group in uh, uh, Ottawa, right? Ottawa. Well, we talked about Montreal as well, but I mean, that whole area we were talking about the corporate travel drying up and so forth. And it kind of lends itself to a little bit of what we're talking about is the change in landscape of the, the modalities. And, and there was an article that Robert put up, I'll put the link up right now, that the airline industry in particular is literally saying corporate travel will never be the same again, period, done. Which lends itself to what we're talking about where, you know, I, I agree with that, you know, in my market here, housing prices are going up and it's like, well, why? And it's because everybody in Miami and everything else says, I don't have to live here anymore. I don't have to pay to be here anymore. I, I don't be remote. Yeah. And I can be across the other side and still do my work. And over there is cool. So, you know, and, and I can live by Lauren and, you know, it's all right. Uh, so <laughs> just, put so light, just put in lightning rods if you're going to live near Lauren. Yeah, yeah, just make sure there's a conduit outside of me on that Lauren one. But. is the lightning rod, Ed. No additional lightning rods are necessary. <laughs> That's, that that yeah. is fair. But, but, um, but to that end, the corporate travel aspect is, you know, the, the airlines are saying, look, you're going to have to sit beside a stranger. You're going to have to go over. But the, mode, the the purpose of travel, the reason why there'd be so many people traveling is changing. And from the article here, let me put it up that, that, that Robert had, is is very different now in that sense. Um, here it is, how COVID is changing everybody's travel. Um, in the future tense, from our marketing perspective, we have to incorporate that into our, whoops, that's a really long link. Oh, he left the freaking track on it. Um, <laughs> Robert, <laughs> scrub those things. <laughs> so, so talking to this, and I've actually, you know, talked about this a little bit uh, in some other things I've done, but I like for embassy suites and stuff like that, that are, you know, really feeling pain right now because they're kind of a middle. They're, you know, some leisure, but, you know, also some light corporate, like they, they're not big meetings, things like that. This could be a win for them. 
because with the uh, disbursement of work groups, you're going to, there's going to be a rise in demand for small meeting, you know, for teams getting together as little bits, not entire companies getting together. And I think you're going to see that like, you know, uh, there are going to be commonalities like the people from, you know, moving from San Francisco because they worked for Facebook and Google, they're all going to go in kind of clusters to similar areas just because of the profile of how they're going to make decisions. Um, you know, the thing that drove them to what their career is, is going to be the same type of thing that's going to kind of edge how they pick where they want to live. And so there'll be groupings of them. And that will even make it to where groupings of Google employees who move from San Francisco to wherever are going to want to get together just locally as well. So I think small meetings could be a very interesting landscape um, moving forward uh, because of this great kind of disbursement of the workforce. Right. And even with remote travel, you know, you'll have your small group meetings in certain areas, but there may also, once they feel like it's safe to do so, there may actually be more large meetings, right. but there's going to be a huge lull between now and then. Mm -hmm. Did you guys see the, the article about REI? No, no, I just saw that this no. morning. I'll paste it in. So REI has decided remote works great, and now they're selling their corporate headquarters. They're sending everybody home permanently. And I think that that is, you know, to Richard's point about people trying to get out of office space, that makes sense. You know, you, now is not probably the time to convert to office space unless maybe it's like a, a WeWork, you know, type model where people want to get out of their houses a little bit more. It's just changing the entire landscape of how the whole country works. And honestly, it's a shakeup I think we've needed for quite some time, as painful as it is in between. Yeah, you know what, you bring up a very interesting concept, just as you're talking about this, it made me think of something totally different. So say, take a big company and say, we're out of here. There's no central location that we can gather the Indians around the wagons and you know, all that kind of stuff. And now we still have to have those moments in time where we all have to get together and right. spend some quality focused, yeah you know, it's like scrum stuff, like, okay, let's just dive into this. And we're hardcore seven days of everybody, you know, and now all of a sudden a hotel can book itself out. Let's say, okay, XYZ company's coming in. We're taking the whole place over. We're taking all the common spaces over. I mean, this is future tense because obviously we have to get some safety protocols in place by then anyway. And we're just going to nosedive into this. And this is an annual thing for us. And maybe it's two weeks, who knows? And and just it's a hardcore uh, isolation focused thing before everybody goes back to their independent uh, operations. I and mean, that's a that's a that's a model of this now. is this has happened before. So the financial crisis did that to call centers. So yes. like where we have our office is in a hub just outside of Orlando that used to be hundreds of thousands of square feet per building of just call centers. And when the financial crisis hit, it was also around the time tech had caught up where you could do distributed call centers really easily. So none of those companies came back to buildings. So there's massive empty space in this area because this area was developed to house call centers. And, um, you know, so we've seen this before and, and it is, it, it is going to happen like this, this, uh, you know, work from home or work from smaller clusters of, you know, offices, um, because there are also, there is certain types of work that does require some, you know, face-to-face uh, -face collaboration. There's also certain types of personality. I'm one of them. I don't like to work from home. I like the social aspects of, you know, the, the conversations you have in the break room and things like that. Um, so, I mean, it's not going to completely die, but it is going to substantially change. And a lot of jobs that for a long time could have been dispersed will now be unlocked to be dispersed, uh, which again is going to be at the, uh, expense of these top cities. Uh, you know, this is a problem for San Francisco. This is a problem for New York city. This is a problem for Chicago. Um, because why stay in an incredibly expensive place to live with an incredibly high tax base? when your job isn't the thing tethering you anymore. Mm -hmm. Now I just had a vision of cooler Ed saying, leaning against the water cooler going, hey, you hear about the aliens? <laughs> <laughs> Government said UFOs are real. <laughs> what do you think of that? You know, you think about some of the other companies too that are in markets that are, let's say, less less favorable right now. So there's one particular very large OTA company that, uh, that I won't name, but you can figure out who it is. Uh, this is largely based out of Seattle. 
Well, who in the bloody hell wants to move to Seattle right now? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, and and so that's the. It's going to have an interesting impact on a lot of things. Uh, and I've and I've been kind of watching some of the ones I thought were going to be interesting changes. Like we should see. We may even see it in this next election. But I think the electoral college. Uh, I think you're going to see traditional states that were specific, uh, you know, political leaning, uh, start to mix more right you know uh you're going to see red states turn purple blue states turn purple because of this mixing uh, which honestly long overdue maybe it'll actually soften the extremism of the opposite sides of these politics by actually putting people together that think differently i mean imagine that <laughs> that would be great Right. <laughs> but you know what? When you live in New York, you're in such a cocoon that you actually believe that everybody surely must think that way. And then you're shocked to hear on the radio or television something else. It 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 would be it would be nice to to see nice people have conflicting beliefs about things. By the way, you know, someone is not evil for disagreeing with you. That's right. Right. Thank you. right. Unless they're Ed. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nicely done, Tammy. Nicely done. Mainly because usually the reason I'm disagreeing with you is not because I actually disagree with you, just because I'm being argumentative. <laughs> Devil's uh, advocate, Ed. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I remember many times walking out the, out the door with Ed and say, look, what a beautiful sunny day. Is it? Is it really? Look, there's a lot of <laughs> so here, here's a question to the group as well, and it's not specifically around hospitality, but do you think this is going to be a generational thing? Do you think this, because everybody in here seems to be in consensus that everybody wants that, the, the, the social connection, everyone wants to sit around at a, a desk and, you know, have the kind of scrum sessions. Do you think that's going to die out? Because I do. Yeah. Um, I really do think it's going to die out. I think looking at some of, look at, my kids looking at Tris's kids who are slightly older, they don't go, they don't knock on each other's doors to play and to go mm. out and to socialize and to play games. They send a message via Xbox saying, You you're online. Or do you want to play this? And and they seem to be so much more comfortable with the 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 integration of virtual contact and virtual relationships. So well we've all grown up with this kind of the 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 sort of unspoken knowledge that you get more done in person than you do on a screen, 10 times, 50 times more productive. Is that just my generation? In 15, 10, 15 years from now, when, we're when the, the children leaving school are going into the world of business, are they going to be more, I mean, they've, they've experienced, they've watched their parents have eight months of Zoom calls. Is there going to be a need for this? I mean, I said it a couple of weeks ago, and I think it was Stuart who laughed at me when I said business travel is scuppered. Um, and I do think in the long term- I think he was it, laughing because of your choice of word. <laughs> <laughs> I think in the long term, it's it's scuppered. I think there's, it's eventually going to die out. We aren't going to people aren't going to travel to do well, business then, because they're going to grow up doing it that way. Has anybody seen the movie or read the book Ready Player One? Yeah, yes. I was about to say we're literally yeah, talking about this movie yeah. right now. <laughs> that, that VR world is. I mean, I've I've got an Oculus Quest. I've played games on that thing. It's amazing. Oh, buddy, it's Amen. not that far off. No, and then, I mean, just by the way, what's right after Ready Player One is Wally. So, yeah. <laughs> so I think we need uh, to look at this too from a psychological aspect, though, because I both agree and disagree. I think that the new generation will be way more comfortable working remotely, right? But I don't believe that in person meetings and things like that are going to completely go away because even like if I look at my 10 year old stepdaughter, she is super bummed that she's doing school online. She feels basically depressed because she can't go see her friends. She can't hang out with them. And so even though they might send a message to say, hey, do you want to play? I think that we see that more right now because that's their only option. But when you really sit down with them, they miss seeing their friends in person. So and there is you put on a VR huge... headset and you were there? Yeah, it but see, my, my, my nine-year-old and six-year-old are doing, they're playing virtually in right. Roblox and things like that with their friends. They've built houses with their friends and are mm -hmm. you know, decorating them. And they're, they're getting some value out of that. But I, I agree with what Lily's saying. Both of my children 
are so incredibly excited to go back to school next week because they miss just the stupid downtime right that that doesn't happen even in structured play like when you you know bring someone over they're generally like hey you're only here for an hour so do something whereas right. like you know the 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 unstructured kind of interaction i think is what they're craving um, because both of my kids are like, we, we want to go back to school. We want to get out of this house. And they consider, I was explaining this to my wife yesterday, because my daughter said, like, I've been home nonstop. And my wife's like, we've been home one day this week. We were at the beach. We went to Crayola. We did this. And I said, yeah, but Andrea, like, when Harper is with us, no matter where we are, that's home, right? right. It's She misses being with other people and and misses that aspect of it so yes while they're more comfortable with this digital interaction um humans are a pack animal um you know there it's never going to it's never going to completely go away it's going to show up in different ways um but the complete isolation uh is is never going to occur because we're not wired that way as as beings as a species oh, i get that i get that but just to follow up the point if if you segment business business and then your personal life if you i mean if you do your business life virtually and you have your one-on-one -on -one connection and your one-on-one -on -one time with your not real life friends but your social circle your family and your physical friends the segmentation there is you get your hit of dopamine from personal contact here but this bit can all be done virtually still you don't need this you don't need to travel for meetings to sign contracts but i actually disagree with that because one of the things that keeps me coming back to this industry are the connections i've made with the people in this industry that i would never have met in my personal circles i met them because of what my job is but i'll also be honest with you i don't think i'd ever go on vacation with them um, but I do enjoy we're getting we're together we're with some them at to events. We're missing some component of this. And this goes from older, younger generation. The, 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 the pendulum swing is the, 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 those of you that have younger kids now see the reality of what they can be doing with technology in the future tense of dialogue and interaction and the need and the concentration. I'll throw in the old person's version of this. Silence in business, when you're in a room and you are uncomfortable, and you have nothing to say and you don't know what to say and they don't know what to say. Sometimes it's the most creative process out of that. What you're talking about Ed, when you're, you know, you miss interaction in, in the break room, the, the accidental dialogue that goes along with the in, lack of intensity of, I only have an hour, so I want to build a house virtually with you, but rather we're sitting around doing nothing. What do you do? I don't know. What do you want to do? Next thing you know, inspiration comes out of that. Dialogue comes out of that. Creativity comes out of that. And also disagreement comes out of that, which creates solutions in its own way. So, all of that comes from the interpersonal relationship. Now, to Dean's point, and I do agree with this, there is a virtual component of this that we have yet to dro drop into the future tense that may allow us to still have that where you are virtually engaged, although not physically, but that allows for what I just mentioned as to the dialogue back and forth. Like, I don't know. I don't want to fly a spaceship today. What do you want? I don't know. What do you want to do? Yeah. And you just sit around doing nothing, but by doing nothing, you come up with something better. So right. there's still that yeah. potential. Yep, but I don't. And, I don't, I don't and, and, and just understand, like the only place I'm hung up on Ben is the completely dying. So first of all, in the travel industry, nothing ever dies. Okay, there is zombies in this industry that have lived on forever, that have been way past their you know need, um, and yet still are you know fairly large companies and fairly large business models because nothing dies in travel. Nothing. Okay. So yes, I'm with will, that point. It, will it change and will it not look at all like it does today? Because let's face it, there are a lot of road warriors that are road warriors because their job initially needed that way back when, um, but it's not necessary anymore. So will I see? Will you see people like that travel substantially less for business? Yes, um, but I don't think I don't think meetings and I don't think conventions and I don't think any of that's going to die. Uh, but I, and I do think that there will be a cause and effect. Road warriors lessening their travel will actually probably make them attend large scale meetings um, more often than they would have previously because they're not getting any face to face time with certain levels of customer and things like that. And that's their chance to do it. So I, 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 
I think business travel will exist. It will probably be a similar size economy as it is today. It's just going to be done differently. It will be across very different uh, benefactors than it previously was. And honestly, yeah. the other thing too is that we're not really talking about, and maybe because it's business travel, so it seems weird, but the importance of touch. Like we need touch as humans. And a lot of places now you get to know your business colleagues and you greet them with a hug instead of just a handshake or something like that. So part of that comes from those in-person meetings, in-person school for the kids. So I don't foresee all in-person going away. In fact, if it does, I want to move to another planet because we're going to see so many deeply rooted psychological issues if people are not interacting face to face that it's going to be a scary place well, also too, have a problem with hug. I'm, I'm, I'm very cold and distant like that but um the, the you have to share experiences the time right. you guys went out and grabbed a drink at the bar and you ended up singing and yeah. dancing at the pool table you know that doesn't happen virtually there i mean Ben, I'm thinking of the time that you and I, well, no, we haven't done that yet. But anyway, just, uh, you know. <laughs> it's on my bucket list, no, buddy. Go on, Dean. Go on. You were going to no, say. No, I've, I've been a remote employee for, oh, goodness, uh, eight years or maybe more. So remote, remote working is not new to me. But I will tell you that that is the one thing that I really miss is even if you just have a general question, being able to stand up over your cubicle and say, hey, hey, what would you do with this? Right. That being able to have that type of as opposed to sending an email or a chat or whatever, the around the water cooler conversation. What are people doing in their lives? You have no idea. And, and even at, as a speaker, I've spoken at many events. And, you know, as a speaker, you look out in the crowd and you read the crowd a little bit. Right. What what's working, what's not. And you can read that crowd. Really hard to do that on a webinar, even on a Zoom where you've got like our windows here. Imagine you have this with 100 people. Really hard to read a Zoom call. That same way. So there's just a lot of interaction that you can't get from that yeah, online. I, uh, Dean, I disagree because I've, I've been in front of a group and all I get is a blank stare all the time. And I'm so used to it now. Yeah, I don't... <laughs> that's because your zipper was down, but that's another thing entirely. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me, let me overlook like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> let me have a clarity here uh, on the points you guys have made. I don't think it's a good thing. I don't think it's a positive thing at all to, to for, for people to become. I mean, you're right. It's a slippy slope to Wally. It really, really is. But I, I think the way I'm – like my, my wife works in education. Um, my wife's a teacher. And everyone gets a laptop and everyone is gets remote courses and everything is done – so that you don't have to actually ever meet a teacher. You can you have the teacher's personal email address. You have recorded lessons. This is how they're getting brought up that you don't need, or that, that, that it's almost been suggested they don't need the contact with it. You can get everything you need from sat behind a screen. Now, I'll- You can get all the tangibles, but the untangibles of being forced to interact with people who are, are mean to you, being forced to witness other people being treated unfairly, a lot of these things develop your moral compass. Uh, it's not just your parental training. It's not just your familial training. There are times in your life that you are either part of or witness things that you only would be part of or witness if you were forced together with other people that do develop the core of your humanity. Um, and you can't digitize that. I mean, or it would be really weird like, oh, hey, now it's time for you to go get teased. Uh, so we're doing your digital teasing session this morning uh, to help toughen you up a bit. Um, and then, I don't know. I hey, think, it's no, time I for you point. to go no, be I'm really I'm glad mean. you clarified that because I was going a whole different direction when you mentioned. <laughs> I disagree now. In, in, I don't know if it's like in the US, but in the UK, you have massive anti-bullying, anti-digital trolling. Yeah. So but it still happens. It still happens, but you're still exposed to that. You still see that happening. Yeah, but it's a, it's a different, it's a different uh, scenario because actually it's worse when it's digital because it's faceless. People are braver when their persona is not tied to it. Just look at Twitter. Twitter yeah, is a cesspool of negativity where Absolutely you know a lot point. of the people behind that probably are fairly nice people that just have this weird persona when there's no accountability to who they are. Um, but my so, point is, they're still exposed to that. You're still, you get put, di and we have gone yeah. way off a tangent of digital marketing. I think, I, think, I think a better analogy would be saying that you get the nutrition of food without the flavor and taste and enjoyment of it. You <laughs> get what you eat, but you don't get the experience of enjoying getting it. It's like a meal replacement bar. Right. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's like Weight Watchers, but only worse. <laughs> you know, it's something for those of us that have a, a, a partner or family or a social circle already. But if you're if you're a young person or maybe you're move, you've just moved like me and you want to make friends in a social circle wherever you are, there's just nothing like going to an office and getting to know people in a in an really in-depth way. Uh, and and those obviously a lot of people marry people that they worked with at one point or another. I would hate to be single in today's time without going to an office, have, have somebody, have a place where I can interact really face-to-face -face with other people. You bring up a good point to it though. Back when, when Match and everybody else and whatever the other the earliest ones were, you know, um, came out, those of us that met our significant other, our better half, never could see how that could have happened electronically for other people. Like, how do you, how do you, Put enough information in about you and they and them to find out that there's some correlation and then you have to go through the process of meeting and greeting and all this other stuff to it you know me it was back in the day it was just get drunk at a bar and see who still was around at two o'clock but that was just me you know <laughs> well, to your point lauren they didn't find somebody online and get in a relationship online without first True. meeting in person meeting in i'm saying that yeah. transition was a, a unique one so mm -hmm. we're talking about the same kind of unique transition in the future tense. Like, how will we evolve where even lesser personal engagement has been pointing out and uh, that is there to do what you need to do, but there's still a requirement of some aspect of that to be in their lives. Because the part that I'm worried about is the, the echo bubble that we create for ourselves in social media right now, that if we're only surrounded physically by friends that nurture and our family that nurture us and are supportive of us and share the, the perspective of us and so forth, <laughs> We're not going to be trained, as Ed says, for the bullies out there that say, "Uh, uh no, my opinion is better than your opinion." Uh, 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 you know, and and even being digital as it is, and, and the pain that that has, it's the you know, did you get your ass beat uh, by physically by somebody because they disagreed with you, and you disagreed with them, and they punched you. You know. So I'm going to turn this back around to hotels and try and dub. <laughs> Why would we do that on hospitality <laughs> marketing? I mean, I did say it was a tangent. I did say it was a tangent. <laughs> so we're talking, like, with the article REI, right? So they sell off cor uh, their corporation. Everybody's working remotely. Do we not think that that actually has the potential to lead to more business for hotels? Because you're still going to have even the smaller group meetings, right? Now maybe the sales team meets up quarterly altogether or the uh, accounting team has a once a month lunch to where they get together or those types of things. So do we not see that there's a potential? Well, yes, the, um, you're not you're not maybe having quite as much business travel, right? I do think business travel is going to shrink a bit. I don't think it's going to go away, and I think that's where some of us the the, the scuppered or the gone. I don't think it's gone. I think it's going to change. But do we not think that this could actually have a positive effect in the long run once there's safety protocols and you know the, we have a virus and uh, I mean we have a vaccine and the virus goes away and all those things. That could, this could actually be a benefit to hotels. I, I do think it could have more travel in the future because of everything that you said, Tammy, but also because if I'm, if I'm working from home, I may be working from anywhere. And that means I can go someplace for three weeks if I want to work during the day and then it enjoy a different local atmosphere, you know, in the evening and on the weekend. That's cheating, Adele. That's not business travel. That's bleaser. <laughs> what are you talking about? That is bleaser. That, that is not even bleaser. It's it is leisure because I'm going. I'm I'm yeah. working. That's not a part of my. That's not a part of my business. I'm not going for business reasons. But my, you know, my 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 husband and my dog can enjoy the mm -hmm. lovely well, surroundings of some other place. Well, also we're talking about the fact we make the assumption that everybody hates living where they work. That's not true. There's a portion of us probably that don't like living where they are because of work being tethered to them and they will make the move that we're talking about. And then there's other people who go, hey, this place thinned out pretty good. I like staying here, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and they're going to want to be around. Yeah, I mean, and, and, uh, yeah, I'm a, 
you're talking oh, about ahead. this travel thing that people might gather together on a regular basis, like you're saying, Tammy, simply for their weekly meeting. Like, let's get in the same room. And they don't have a corporate office anymore because it was dissolved. And a hotel fits a perfect bill. Like, I'm going to, you know, Fridays is is Rotary Day. You know, we're going to go to have a Rotary meeting. You know, and, and, and they show up and it's an all-day thing and you're in the same room and you collaborate with the people that didn't make it. But you're all still in the same general proximity, so you can still gather. And then you have your larger gatherings where people are being brought in because it's that time of year for us to have our quarterly or our semi-annual or whatever. And we have our big gathering for everybody to be into. So, yeah, it will change. I do think the business will be like that in some ways. Yeah. Well, one thing is for certain, if you currently have no way to have a hybrid meeting that is partially with remote people and partially with people in your meeting room, you better start working on that right now because that is definitely going to stay because I think there's going to be more of a sensitivity to high risk populations and things like that, that want to participate, but can't attend. And so I think the hybrid meeting is going to be a huge outcome of what's going on here. And by the way, Lou, thank you for keeping the dialogue with Madeline and Virginia about the room space and so in their chat off to the side. We really haven't addressed much of their conversation. I apologize, Madeline and Virginia, for that. Uh, Virginia first sparked that with us. You know, what was the cost factor associated with common space? And you came back well with about the, the yieldability of it and, and you're hoping not being given away. And then Madeline comes back and Madeline is the de facto woman about weddings. I know Madeline for many years and she is brilliant when it comes to solving the ability for weddings to be gathered and how to coordinate. And uh, she has been in that space uh, almost, I think, all the time I've ever known her. So, and that's been quite a while. So, Madeline, thank you for being with us today as well. Um, so, yeah, uh, that was just the, the corporate conversation. Thanks, Ben, for bringing us down to the rabbit hole. Uh, drink this, eat that, whatever. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> Was there any other, before I drag, drag anything else that Robert shared with us today, was there any other topic that anybody wanted to bring in that I know I'd asked anybody if they, they had anything in particular they wanted to bring into the conversation today? All righty then. Well, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for bringing everything to show and tell today. <laughs> well, I assume we're touching on the uh, topic of budgeting at some point, given the title. Yes, I did bring in, uh, and this has been, and, and, and Ed, this is a little reflection of our conversation yesterday with Canada. Um, about, All of Canada, by the way, Lauren and I addressed the entire country. We did. We did. We <laughs> sit on the pulpit and, and just the entire country was there for us and we talked to everybody. Actually, we had some pretty, we had some really neat, engaged people from Canada. And I think there's a possibility they joined us this day, today as well because they heard Ed pontificate on great stuff, and then I was just there for candy. Uh, what a candy. different, what a different Ed they're getting today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but we are entering because, as we always like to joke, we're the only industry that has a season for this budgets. Um, we're entering into the first role of of what budget is supposed to be for us going towards 2021, and. It's not a stationary thing. I mean, historically, for me, for what I've ever used to do, I basically produced three budgets, which was the one I hoped I got, the one that I probably end up getting, the one that somewhere is in the middle that we can hopefully get to. Um, the This is, I mean, my budgeting with my clients right now is multiplicities every day. It's a, it's a daily variation at, based on which channel is producing, which market we're chasing, what demographics are moving, and then to know whether or not we have to to dry up or shift or move, how much investment we're doing into the long-term, you know, content thing. We, we, we've had this on the show where we talked about the fact that our websites and who we are and what we are is an answer system at this point. It's, it's not about selling rate and dates. It's about answering questions that our guests have about us for them to make travel decisions for those that are. We know that we're dealing with a unique segmentation of traveler right now. Those that are the, basically the low risk pro, you know, they don't, they don't see this as a risky thing for them to travel and those that have to travel, but there's a whole section of travel that is latent right now that waits for that safety level that they're willing to be comfortable with to make the decision to travel. And we don't want to, and Ed made this a brilliant point yesterday, don't let your CRM data go dead. You know, don't you keep in constant communication with them for the aspirational travel, the future travel, all of that. So you have to budget for that. You have to you have to spend money making sure that that stays alive. How do you balance that with actual cash flow and targeting that you're doing right now? Hmm. I think what we're seeing from uh, some of our clients is unsurprising caution. Um, but uh, to talk about segmentation, Lauren, from yourself, there, it's not only not only people who who think there is a low risk to travel, but 
people who think there is a low risk to travel whose countries are allowing them to travel. Mm. So you have to, it's not only, oh, I want to travel. You turn to the country you want to go to say, am I okay to travel to you? Because I feel like I'm okay to travel to you. And they look at your country and go, absolutely not. <laughs> because you guys are rampant with disease. And you, you have to, what we're essentially playing is whack-a-mole with geo-targeting, I feel like. This yeah. week, yeah, we can put some budget to you. Oh, actually, no, you guys have shut your borders, right? No, okay, we'll move. It's like a massive game of risk, and you're just moving marketing budgets around the world constantly. And <laughs> yeah. what we're finding is is uh, clients that may have been a little bit more laid back, not laid back, but less involved, more trusting, and more we can rely on the results because we've got it previously, have suddenly found a send button on emails. Uh, and it's just quick, quick, just quick question, just quickly. What we're we doing on this? What we're we doing on this? Because the pressures they're under are flowing mm -hmm. down to of, flowing down onto them, and then obviously they flow onto us as well. So not only are we playing whack a mole with geo targeting and the kind of offers because they change as well. I mean, one of our one of our clients um, towards the Caribbean, it, they have they have bubble countries then larger bubble countries and then smaller bubble countries and those change all the time and they don't know when it's going to happen so what we're finding is the segmentation isn't just who you think you should be advertising to and who you think the clients are who are going to stay it changes daily based on if they can or can't go mm -hmm. Very true. So it's easy. <laughs> I, I, i'm going to whine for about for just a minute there's a fundamental change that has to happen in our industry on the decision processes within our the companies that run hotels. What you mean? A twelve person committee for every decision is not effective. Pretty much. <laughs> no, it should be fifteen. <laughs> it's the hey guys, th and, and Dean, I'm going to pull you out on this one. Meta Search is getting twenty five to one right now for you. We should load up on this because while the getting's good and it's going to eventually diminish anyway or change, what well, this is where we can make some money. So I spend the next two weeks talking about uh, you know, what this value proposition is through, through, through the committees of decision process. Like, okay, owners are worth it. And I literally get down to the point, it's like, if I gave you, if you gave me a dollar and I gave you $25 back, how many dollars would you want to give me? Oh, a lot of them. Then why don't you understand? I'd at least give you the 25 bucks you just gave me. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not going to stay that way because obviously, and Dean can t talk more technical about this than I ever could about this, about, you know, the fact of, of voice and presence and, and budget amount and, you know, the fact that we're getting that returns based on how much budget we put towards it and how much exposure we're given to and the, you know, all that kind of stuff. But the reality of it is, is that these things pop up and they're opportunistic and you need to jump on them. By the time you get the decision process and the direction to get onto to do it, that opportunity has changed, diminished or gone. And this goes to yeah. the marketing treasure you point to, Ben, is that one minute it's let's target this geo. And by the time the decision to get the funding, the targeting, the correction, the campaigns, <gasps> that geo has gone. And yeah. wait a minute, now we got to go to the other geo. And, and you're chasing this down, not really benefiting from what you're telling them you know about that market opportunity. And it, it, the, the response and the decision tree mm -hmm. and all this process has to grow uh, in, a, in a speed fashion. It has to get faster. Tell me you look like you're going to yeah. say something. Well, and I also, I also think too, you know, attribution, right? The age old question comes into play here because what happens, I mean, it happens more often than, than I can count is the owner looks at the bottom line and yes, someone came through three or four different channels, but book direct because they finally bookmarked and came and booked direct. And so the owner goes, well, why am I paying all this money for marketing? Because everybody's booking direct. So let's just stop everything, right? Not understanding or thinking through all of the other components. And then the other thing I think that is a challenge for hotels, I was just talking with one of our, um, our non-hospitality sales reps the other day. You have the hotel, so you know your GM, your DOS, everyone else who's involved. You have your management company. Mm -hmm. You have the brand. You have the asset ownership. manager, you have ownership, <laughs> you, you have the consultant, right? So there's four, five, six different people involved, not even counting, you know, getting up to the 12 of ed when you count two or three from each one of those entities. And they don't always have the same priorities or the same, um, uh, goal, right? I mean, the goal is to make money, but they, well, they don't always have the same goals. And so those competing goals, how do you work through that? So I think until we can really help hotels understand 
attribution and funneling and, and not just, hey, my your dollar for 25 example, which is a great example, but even more holistically, hey, you know what? This channel up here, while you're not going to see a direct return when you look at your Google Analytics e-commerce tracking reporting, but we can see that this is funneling down and getting you that 25 return when you're down here. So let's look at how we're, we're budgeting for you to make sure that you're continuing to grow. The other thing I think in a, in a normal environment, an election year would be insanity for budget season. I mean, that's, that's typically, we're not in a normal environment. I'm not going to say, I, I hate new normal. I hate unprecedented. I don't know why I hate both of those terms. This is a crazy time. And on top of everything we have going on here in the U.S., at least, we have an election year. And that throws a whole nother monkey wrench. And I think right now people are, are scared, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing a lot of no decision because they're afraid to make one. But I would say this to hotels, you got to start thinking about making some decisions um, and, and do something to help right. yourselves out. And I think, you know, it makes sense as you're looking at your budget, assume that things aren't going to get better for the next 12 months. Make your plans based on that so that you can be here when all of this business, we're talking about how much of an influx of business we're going to have when things open back up. It's just a matter of getting to the other side of the moment. And I think sometimes we get so far into our own heads that we feel like this is going to go on forever and life is over the way that we knew it. And even if there is a new normal, which I also hate, Tammy, um, or, you know, whatever, whatever comes out of this, you have to be positioned with certain things. You have to have a good product. You have to have good service. Like, spend your time focused on that and making sure that you can take care of your debt service between now and then at your current business levels mm -hmm. and make those smart, strategic, profitable decisions. Yeah. I think you bring to a great point, too. We're at a heightened set of, of constant it's like playing a, if you were an athlete playing a never-ending game and you're never pulled out of the game it, you're it, it, as soon as you're done with one set you get the next set or you get the next play you get the next play and there's never a break moment for this and we're all of us going through this mental fatigue program of okay what's going on today <laughs> you know <laughs> at some point like, all this stuff oh, has got to do something right yeah, and we have this heightened thing. And also I think what's contributed to us as well is we have been building up, I, we, we, we make comments about this, but there's a truth to this. Everyone, uh, their, their incompetence rises to its own level, you know, and there is a lot of very incompetent people in charge of stuff that they should never have been in charge of. And now we're facing, when we're asking for decisions from some people, they don't know how to make the decision. They were, they were good at using the terminology, the buzzwords. They knew how to be friendly to the right people to get whatever they wanted. And I'm not saying all people, but all industries have this systemic issue. It's not just our industry. But there are people in positions that don't make decisions, don't have the ability to make decisions, and don't want to make those decisions because they'd be held culpable and then possibly responsible, and then they would lose whatever it is that they gained by being where they were. And so to your point, Tammy, you got these layers within our industry that add on top of it where an agency, any one of those links – with what I just described is a bad link. An agency that only talks about within its own service profile never gives a truthful answer to its client because it only answers to what it can sell, not what it should do, what it's capable of being done, what it can sell to their client that they can do for themselves. So if somebody outside brings that into them, their first filter is, do we do that? Do we want to do that? Can we do that? Can we charge for it? Do we want to recommend it? I'm not I'm saying everybody. I'm going to disagree just a little slightly there. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. I've been known to tell customers actually with products that that where we have where what they needed didn't lie. Say, you know what? You're better off going. With You're not that company. Business. That's what I'm saying. You guys are great at that. You bring great content to the market. You've shown up and said, "Let's help you with stuff that we don't even do, but we know people that do this." Here's some stuff. You're not that person. You're not that company. Ben's that company. Ben only does what he wants to do. That's a, you know, I'm going to speak exactly to that point that you're making, Lauren, because I mean, not, I'm sorry, I'm going to plug myself here for a moment. That's why I started BasecampMeadow.com is because what we have in the industry is a situation where individual hotels have cut staff. So if you had an e-commerce department at all, you probably got rid of them, which means that some other guy who was before doing another job has now got to be cross-trained with how to run all of your digital marketing, meta search included, right? 
more likely scenario is that that hotel now says, well, you know what? I don't have anybody to do this. I'm going to outsource it to an agency. And they've got their cousin who runs a little digital agency out of the garage, whatever. And they say, hey, Joe, can you do this meta search thing for me? And he says, well, yeah, I, you know, yeah, sure. I can do that. I've been doing search engine marketing for all this time. And they think, okay, yeah, let's do that. But the fact is that, no, that's not the same thing because it's not just Google. And there has to be that cross-channel optimization, diversification that Stuart was talking about earlier, all those different things. But we have that happening within our industry where now people are trying to cover roles that they, in, in their defense, it's not that they're stupid. They just weren't supposed to do this in the first place. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this just isn't what they were supposed to do. And so how do they then uh, fill in those gaps? Right. Yeah. And, and that's, I'm just, I'm putting out a negative example in, in play just of the fact that there are people within that chain that you refer to, Tammy, of the ownership versus the uh, management company versus the asset management company that's reflecting the owners. There's this, this, they don't want to be the person that makes the final decision to be held responsible for it as much as they may be obligated to get the answer from above or differently than themselves. You know, you can't work outside the brand framework. So there is a mea culpa that has to go along with brand. Uh, you can't work outside what ownership says as parameters of when it comes to this much money to be spent or this, I need to be giving the final approval for that. So the asset management company can't make the decision. They have to go to the ownership and make the reflection to it. We create these own, in own internal barriers. My complaint to the whole process is, was, is that any organization should look at those current barriers and see how can we thin them out, streamline them, or re regulate certain thresholds that decisions can be made without the entire gang of people having to go through the process of it. Yeah, I, com I completely agree. Um, I also think that some costs have to be uh, looked at as a cost of per reservation or it, it's a reservation cost more than a marketing cost if i am able to do something and i can get 25 dollars back uh stop complaining that i'm spending ten thousand dollars at a time over and over again look what i'm getting and uh, although I do think that sometimes we have to take into account um, what the cancellation factor is going to be on those future reservations, yes. sometimes uh, an OTA, let's say you have a, uh, a featured listing description of your hotel that's coming up, for example, and the result that they give you is going to be on the whole whole revenue brought in, not your portion of the revenue brought in. And you have to factor that and the cancellation uh, in order to, to to give a true market, a, a, a true, you know, a true barometer for what, what is happening. But, you know, please don't tell me that I should only spend 5000 a month when 15,000 a month is going to give me three times more revenue and it doesn't really work like that because there is some diminishment, you know, the more you spend. But uh, yeah, give us the flexibility. And another thing I really agree with Lily said, thank you, Lily, for saying take care of your product and your service because there are so many things that you can do that don't actually cost money. And and social media is one of them. It's, it's the last thing that you should not be doing it, mm -hmm. when it's free. And if you spend a little, you can spend just little, 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 little tiny bits of money and you can see the result of it. So why wouldn't you do that? Focus on that. And, you know, review sites are social media. They're user generated content. You have to be focused on how can I get the most out of that? without spending a single dollar. Mm -hmm. Work. I agree with Adele, but I would also add on that we need education for all of the revenue generation teams around flow through because sometimes 25 to one isn't the whole story either. Right. Although it's, it's mm -hmm. an indicator. You then have to look at, okay, how, so I got this much revenue. Was that a hundred rooms at $50 ADR? 
was that one room at a $500 ADR? What is the cost to me for occupying that room? What was the booking fee? What was the staffing that was required for that room? So you really get down to the net level because that's what we should be measuring against marketing spend is the flow through at the end, not just the top line revenue or else you can revenue yourself right out of business. Sure, sure. See, Lily, uh, you're I just would... trying to put math into the equation. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll add an old school. I'll, I'll add an old school term that I'm using in my budget process right now, and that's called crash kits. And for anybody that's been in the hotels industry long enough, hotels used to have what was called a crash kit when electricity would go off and so forth. That you always had the daily arrivals on a printed sheet. Uh, that you had the methodology of knowing who was in house. Uh, you had the methodology of a, and this goes back to ways credit card machine that you could slide across the carbon to go over and charge people because your credit card machine was down. Uh, that was a crash kit. And what I'm incorporating in my, my budgetary process is right now, I refuse to do a budget. Literally have told clients I refuse to do an annual budget. My budget process is 90 days out right now. That's the max I'm going out. Because to your point, I'm planning what, what Lily's saying. Plan it to being bad. Just it's bad. But what I'm adding to my budget component is durability of no income. Crash kit. How long, if I lose everybody, for how long can we operate? What funding is necessary for us to know what we're doing? And how much can I keep that money in that queue forward so that if all of a sudden we turn into a hotspot and bingo, everybody's gone, how long can we keep the business business without income? And to your point, uh, Adele, about the cancellations, that's a, that's a given. Every channel should have a cancellation percentage put into it factored so that you're looking at more true revenue contribution than you are, look at me with my ROAS, you know? <laughs> it's like, no, because it, it, you get you get a 40% cancellation. In New York, and you know better than I do, you can get up to 80% cancellation in third-party channels because everybody's playing the dicey game of, you know, six, seven reservations back in the day before they would cancel the five and leave the one. So you have to factor that into the process. You can't walk around, look at all the contribution I'm doing. It's not my fault that they canceled. No, it is your fault because you're responsible for it. So uh, I've been adding that into the budgetary process. And to add to the other earlier conversation in a microcosm of allowing tolerances financially, um, the Victoria Marriott, uh, which I'm proud to say in Canada years back was the number one Marriott in the Marriott system because of one simple thing that they did and that was the GM decided that every employee could make a $20 decision without approval. Whatever it took for a customer satisfaction, they could go up to $20 without asking a single soul. Sure, they could abuse that. Nobody did. What they did do was when they heard that a, that a guest needed a certain type of toothpaste or that they needed a certain amenity, they ran out to the store and grabbed it and brought it back for the guest. And that reflection of the reviews and so forth put them as number one Marriott in the world for that year. Because Which they allow gives two thousand. See, and that's the kind of process. They, where, they know, say it's not a problem. People don't abuse it, but it gives them enough wow moments that uh, that that's what the Ritz Carlton reputation is based on, yeah. mm -hmm. and that re is reflected across all the hotels because yeah. they did something for one person. Yeah, and I don't know the dollar amount, but Disney does the same thing. Their employees are given the, the flexibility. You know, you see a kid and they drop their ice cream cone, go get them a new one. You see a family, like their trouble, take care of it, right? Mm -hmm. And you're spot mm -hmm. on. That kind of stuff makes for great reviews, which ultimately leads to more reservations. And that tolerance, yeah. I think, is what I'm saying. It needs to be at least it's a temporary solution, if not a permanent one, within our infrastructure, within our industry, for all these layers that we have to engage with, there should be a tolerance that if you're performing at these, this, this, this level, there is no need to go through five different uh, decision trees to get the answer of approval. It's allowable, or it should be functional. Also with the fact that if it doesn't work out, that you're not beaten to death for having fallen off, you know, you tried, you it, was, it was something to do, it did not work. What was learned from it is just as important as whether it was successful too. So, absolutely, you know my uh, the way I approach it. If someone did something that is not the choice I would have made, I would thank that that employee for you know, thank you. You definitely, I can see that you tried to do the right thing, and uh, but it somehow it didn't have the the best outcome. Let's talk about what happened and let's work out another option. 
that you could try next time that will possibly have a much better solution. Never berate an employee who's trying to do the right thing. It's, you know, sometimes an employee, uh, you know, not not any that I ever worked with, but sometimes an employee will do something for their own reasons that have nothing to do with helping the guests or helping the company. That's another story. But if, if they were trying to do the right thing, and, you know, that freedom to act will 95% of the time work out to the advantage of the company and the guests. And, and you'll just have, you know, sometimes you'll make a mistake and that's just human. That's fine. So Lauren, you might remember a couple of weeks ago, I pulled out a book from my bookshelf, the culture code, uh, and I preach it to anyone that will listen. Um, <clears throat> one of the chapters in there is about a, a restaurant and how they build culture in a restaurant. And one of the things the manager says at the start of every shift is, I want you to bankrupt us with your generosity. Uh, <laughs> and, and they were they ranked very, very highly um, on the, the restaurant reviews because they were so generous because the staff were just empowered to just make it a fantastic place. Like I imagine Adele, you would run a restaurant. If I'm quite <laughs> honest. You know what? Generosity is something that you should be talking about every day with your employees as well as kindness and compassion and it will change your financial outcomes i i, I can tell you a true story uh when i wrote my first restaurant i i i was pained pained physically i was my stomach was in the knot when i handed the key over to my hired manager to the restaurant because me as a manager i remember many a day making a bigger than normal sandwich because i could <laughs> or having a, a beer behind the bar while I was doing paperwork because I could. And I was thinking because it was my money that bought all that stuff now, and I'm giving a key to somebody that's probably going to do the same thing that I did to the person that gave me a key to run their restaurant. And I did that, and they did not defy the trust, and, and they didn't hurt the business, and I didn't hurt the business when I did it. And then the next best thing that I did was every supervisor that I had got a key to the restaurant because at times there was a need where – the manager or managers at that point were not available to do what they were doing, but the supervisors were capable of doing, but they didn't have the means to do it because they never key. And I'm sitting there going, Oh my gosh, the trust that that represents was reflected back. Their, their commitment to the quality of what the restaurant was doing grew exponentially compared to when I didn't give them a key. I mean, if I could give a key to every employee, I would have at that point, but it was mindless at that point. But the trust by doing that, we, we forget that we, most people are very good people. That you know, There's always going to be bad decisions. There's always going to be bad people. But that's not, unfortunately, a lot of things that happen like that. There's a lot of good people who do a lot of good things more than the, than the reverse. At least we like to think so. Nowadays, it's sometimes in question. But, um, you know, so, yes, to your point, that, that, that trust and that commitment from everybody is profound. I threw a little link in. Sorry. Um, the, I wanted with, with Stuart here, but he didn't. And that was the, the whole uh, study about consumers' willingness uh, to download an app. Because one, Stuart is, is uh, incredibly adamant about apps compared to web-based applications. And two, he's right in that space because he has one of the best ones out there right now uh, when it comes to keyless entry and so forth. Ben, you guys have like a Skunk Works secret, uh, super secret uh, development division with uh, people in the little basement doing uh, development stuff like that. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> It's not a basement so much as it is. Uh, oh, is it on top of like a skyscraper, like helicopter lands in, James Bond walks out kind of stuff? Is that it? Uh, if you ever saw the guy, I don't think you'd call him James Bond. <laughs> uh, that, that's for certain. Um, so what are, we, we've been working on a fair few pieces of technology recently. And we've said it before on this show, um, and I don't think it'll ever stop by being more relevant than it is now. Now is a time for little people in basements to build technologies. Now, because you're solving problems that you didn't even know you had like eight months ago, and you're having to not cut corners, but learn how to digitally trim them um, so that you're making the most of the time and the resources you've got. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think we're the only people working on some interesting things. I know other companies uh, in our space are also working on interesting things as well. And I, I, I'm quite excited to see what people are going to come out with, if I'm honest, um, when it just settles from all this. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, 
It's amazing some of the diversification. Interestingly enough, I was always been an advocate of QR codes. And I had a lot of people that um, uh, poo-pooed on me like that was a dead man walking technology and so forth. And I kept saying, yeah, that's fine, but it still has applicability. And the reason why I was so adamant, Dean, you know this firsthand. Whenever you go to China, everything has a QR code. Uh, TV true. channels, shows, because there's so much linguistics that go on that is diversity. QR is the only way you sometimes can translate what you're looking at. You know, that's it because that's the only way you could have it put in English or something. And so now that QRs are everywhere again, I have all the people that were uh, arguing with me that it was a dead language, so to speak, and a dead technology going, hey, you called it right. You know, yeah, because it, it now has come back into favor because it's a solution to problems. That you just said, Who would have thought we had to not touch a menu anymore at a right. restaurant? You know? Well, last yeah. night, my husband and I went to a restaurant with two QR things on the table. And because of the way the lighting was worked, nothing would work until we picked it up. And I held it for him. And he, and he did the scan. We were, were contaminated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at, at, first, at first, when I would go out, this is before COVID, when we go out and it was too dark to read, I would be, you know, just pick something off of it like this. Now I've gotten older, I'm like, screw it, here comes the flashlight. <laughs> 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 Meanwhile, everybody around me blinded for the light contrast. But, hey, oh, I the thing is the codes don't work if you put a light on them. Huh? The codes don't work if you shine a light on them because all, <laughs> all the camera picks up is the, is the light. It's so a light on it, yeah. a lot of blind people looking for food in a restaurant, <laughs> touching uh, everything. I haven't totally to the deep where I put the head spotlight on, the Cyclops light, but I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> so I put a link earlier in the chat. Apple put out, they've been putting out a series of movies, which have been kind of interesting. This last one was uniquely interesting. And it goes back to one of our, the, the earlier conversation. I just want to make sure I don't, people can look at it is it talks, it's trying to feature its technologies for solutions for working at home, but it showed some really interesting interpersonal dynamics in that right. process. And that, that movie is six minutes long, not a long one. But it broke it down into where it was showing its technologies, you know, like scanning, you know, taking a picture of something and then making a scan out of it where it does SEO recognition and so forth or being able to share a new task. But it did show the dynamics that we tend to forget are happening in the real world right now about interpersonal play as to who does what in the team environment, where inspiration comes from, how does it work, who leads, who follows, the, the complexities of our, our personal world where kids are people who take care of kids at home and trying to focus on work and you can't focus on work when the kids are like, you know, dropping stuff down the toilet or whatever. It just, it, it, it's really neat video in that sense. I thought it was really brought to light some realities as to what we talk about, because we're talking about the people that can do this, like what we do, but there's a whole lot of people that still have to stand behind a counter and handle a register or cook a meal or serve a meal or deliver a product or sell a product. You know, there's still a lot of people that have to show up physically for work. We don't often remember that in some context of it, but there's a lot of people that don't anymore. And that's the people that we're referring to when it comes to that. So yeah, just, it was a neat, it was a neat video that I forgot to mention when I put it, dropped it in there for it. Does anybody there any, know if those masks with those uh, clear windows actually are effective? Because that seems like that would be incredibly helpful in a restaurant or a hotel. I don't and think so. I haven't There's, heard of any scientific. I know that there's some, as we get more involved in this process, like Delta does not allow for masks that have vents on them. The ones yeah. that allow you to just exhale from them right. because it is not as helpful in protecting other people because you're venting out your breath compared to the going both in and out through the filter process. And that might be something that changes in time. I've heard that the clear ones uh, because they don't really filter anything, the air just blows out the side. That, mm. that, 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 that's a criticism of it. But I think that's a fixable. I mean, if anybody's smart intelligence know how to make that better seal around the, ma the mouth or something like that, uh, whatever. Because I agree with you, you, not knowing if somebody's smiling or sticking their tongue at you is a, is a problem. Um, and and well, if you're a little hard of hearing, like I am, you, you couldn't on the lips, you yeah. really yeah. make out what people are saying. Yeah. Tammy, I'm sorry, you're saying? Okay. I was going to say the exact same thing Adele yeah. just did. You know, for, for people who are hard of hearing or the deaf community, those are very helpful because when they can read lips with masks, you know, you, they can't read, read your lips anymore. Well, and also, it's easier to detect the feeling of the guest. Like, so you can see if there's something that they need mm -hmm. by their expression. 
you know. Yeah. Well, that goes also into our web building and content as well. I did a podcast recently featuring a tool that translates. Uh, by the way, you know, the show, when we're done with it, I translate it into subtext into 10 more languages. And ironically, we're getting a lot of positive comments I get from the, 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 the people that sign back in saying, thank you. And ironically, mostly Filipino. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, I put there it in. Are there. a lot of Filipinos in hospitality. They're amazing. I just, I mean, we, they, 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 they sincerely. I got more than, than, than. I don't even want to guess that, but five, six different comments, maybe, from people from mm -hmm. from that appreciated it being in Filipino. I'm like, because right now we do it in Hindu, uh, uh, Filipino, uh, Japanese, Korean. Uh, then we also have uh, Dutch, my wife, uh, Spanish, mm -hmm. English, uh, German, Italian, and Portuguese. Try Hebrew. Hmm? Try Hebrew. I, you know, I, I actually was going to ask you guys any feedback because I'm basing it on the <laughs> audience. Our audiences are growing up geography-wise based on the languages right now. Um, by adding the language, like the, the Korean, I had I, for a little while, that's Korean popped in. I'm like, oh, that's pretty neat. It was like 0.023% or something like that in viewership. So I put Korean, and now it's like doubled its size. I mean, it's not huge, but it doubled it, you know. And, and, and the point I'm trying to make about it, sorry, off on tangent, but websites and content and things like this for those that are challenged either visually or audibly being able to have it re read to them in their language is it's helpful you know i'm not saying you do you fraction out your entire website to be in 119 languages but you know for the languages that you think you're applicable for it's it's helpful or having subtitles to this stuff i make sure that uh not just this show but also the podcast it gets the subtitles gets it corrected i correct for it and then have it put into the multiple languages so that anybody that wants to watch it can still read what we're talking about. It's not completely accurate. We know that <laughs> it's probably humorous to them in some ways, uh, but it's, it's <laughs> especially it what Ben's stuff sound smarter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Ben's stuff is always screwed up. I got to tell you, every time I go through the transcription, transcription stuff, Ben and Tris's stuff and, and, and Stuart from New Guinea, uh, it's just it's the it's, accent, buddy. It's the accent. There's, there's not an artificial intelligence known to man that can transcribe Northern English. I think it's okay. because they don't know what scuppered means. <laughs> oh, yeah. By the way, that didn't translate well. I can just tell you the variation on that was not a good one. <laughs> okay. Be my friend here, Google. Let's just <laughs> stick a uh, search result into the, the, chat. the other part that I'm looking for is that if, whether we should put Irish in there because we get a lot of people in Ireland. I don't know what's friends of yours, Ben. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, it's, it's funny before you mention um, as I uh, as we as we started the show today, uh, one of my friends who used to work with me at Pegasus sent me a very supportive message. Um, Oi, oi, lad, they'll let anyone on that HSMAI show. Uh, first of all, John, if you're still listening, this isn't HSMAI. This is so much better. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you, tr you truly are attracting the cream of the crop. Cream of the crop. Yeah, well, cream of the crop I can buddy. translate it into Irish if they want to, but I don't know how that comes through. I guess that would be Celtic, wouldn't it? When we're going to be Celtic? You know, I don't Gaelic. even think the Irish. Yeah, I think it's Gaelic. Uh, Gaelic, Gaelic. Okay, okay. But I, I wouldn't hold out for John being able to speak Gaelic. I, and I did watch the TED presentation of the difference between the United Kingdom, Great Britain, and England. Just so you know, because I, I wanted to make sure that I understood exactly, Ben, how to address your nationality. <laughs> Great, because I'm not sure either. Uh, I did draw a very, a very sloppy picture or uh, like on a screen share of like the outline of Britain. here's where i live and this is great britain and this is the united kingdom and this yeah. is you boom if you ever want to push Stuart's buttons tell him that he lives in england or came from he will just light up and give you the drawing that you just did like no 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 <laughs> it's not like me to do that lauren uh, hey okay so I, I don't know if anybody had the chance to look at robert's list of it um but he has a he has the boop and he has the rot row. But was there any other topics of anything else that we wanted to make sure we hit before we lost the rest of the day in time? I do want to point out I do have some. Uh, I'm going to put in for the show now. I have some call to action stuff that I, I need Ben your logo because I'm going to be putting it into the videos. Tammy, I already have Milestones logo, so we're good. Adele, you don't have a logo yet. I do. I do. You? 
Oh, I'm please send it to me. I'm going to send it to you. Yeah. Okay, Lily, I have. Do you want TCRM or do you want uh, ThinkSup Enterprises as the logo when I pop it up on these things? Let's do ThinkSup Enterprises. All right, I'll put ThinkSup, and then uh, Dean, uh, which one do you want me to run with? Uh, go with the Basecamp one. Okay, because uh, uh, for everyone, uh, the, what we do is I post edit this video and redistribute it, and, re and actually I use one stream to rebroadcast it. I've been now doing rebroadcasting on Mondays for the live show, um, and then on Wednesdays. 11.30 a.m. for APAC and 11.30 a.m. your time, Ben, for London uh, again. So it runs three times a week, and then the podcast does the same thing. And, and what I do is I put in the lower thirds when you guys pop on the show. And also now I want to add the logos on it so that, that uh, uh, you know, we, we can see each of the – what, what cool. you represent kind of thing. So, well, I mean, thank you. Uh, no, honestly, we get a lot of people that do refer to the context of – I mean, I get where, you know, uh, somebody will comment to me and say, well, Ben was right about that and you shouldn't have argued with him. You know, I mean, I get weird emails. I like can't that. imagine that's a, that happens a lot, Lauren. <laughs> Sometimes, I mean, what, it's 20 past six on a Friday for me in the UK. Sometimes I'm just here to be an ass. <laughs> <laughs> and you do so well at that. <laughs> Sometimes I just want to just watch the world burn. Uh, and, and you guys are my outlet for a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I do get a lot of uh, inter interesting comments about the dynamics of our conversation. Like when uh, Ed and Stuart were uh, disagreeing with me last week, or was it the week before? I forget which. Last week, a lot of people were saying that you should let them bully you or something. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you should just stand up and say, I'd crush them. I'm about 50 feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but uh, I'll yeah. just take them outside in a storm. Yeah. <laughs> But yes, it is. It is. Uh, it is interesting the dynamics of what our conversations bring. And, and strangely enough, I actually get emails in other languages I have to translate. I got one from Japan the other day, and I'm like, "What am I getting a Japanese email?" And then I had to when I translated, it was about the show. I'm like, "Wow!" So, first of all, you have oh, a terrible stamp deal, producer but... at uh, Meta Search, uh, Basecamp Meta Search is in the in the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that in mind, I think we're kind of at that point. Uh, this there was some world peace or world hunger that we haven't solved yet. I think we hit all the marks. Next week, ooh, we have a guest host next week. Um, they reached out to us from because they watched the show, um, and it is the president of Planable. And if you haven't used the platform, I've been using it for years. I use it for my clients. And what it does is it's a uh, social media posting platform that goes. You can set it up so that the client can approve or comment on the post before it is uh, approved to go for launch. So it's a nice intermediary platform of here's the post for organic, here's the platform it's just going to go on, and then whoever you set up, usually client based obviously or you know editor based, they go through and say there was a spelling or I don't want to use that image or that can we change the logo or whatever it is, and then they can approve. You can also give them authorization to approve it or have somebody else approve it, and then it goes out as scheduled. So it's a nice preemptive social media posting platform. Uh, it has some limitations. I'll be honest with you. With Instagram, you have to do it from your phone. So it kicks a notice to you, takes the content and you have to manually put it out. That's a problem. And they don't do bulk loads, which is a problem, but it creates great calendars. You can put it into a calendar format so the, you know, the client can see where it's posting it all. Tammy, I'm sorry, you want to say something? Well, I was just going to say, um, it's well, two things. One, the Instagram issue is not just planable. It is most of the software tools. Yes, most of the software, yes. Instagram and the API, it's, it's not a limitation of the tool. Um, know that from experience but i would say that this, with a tool like that not only is it great for someone like you that's working with clients but for individual hotels that are listening the ability to set up your your admin and your front desk staff or whoever you want is someone that can contribute content but then there's that level of approval from someone that can go in and make sure is it grammatically correct did tammy spell things right because let's be real grammar <laughs> is not my <laughs> Which is why I subscribe to Grammarly. But, oh, uh, love Grammarly! <laughs> I love Grammarly. Something like that for a hotel, especially now when we're talking about, you know, Adele. I think you had mentioned social media as a free or a very low cost tool in our tool belt. Having that that help from staff and a tool like that that can then help you consolidate and actually get more content to be pushed out, but in a way that's controlled, I think is brilliant. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's so important to engage the full team because you shouldn't have a social media manager. You should have a social media driven company. Uh, everybody should yep. be thinking, what do I see? Do I see something beautiful in the hotel? Let me snap it and, and, and share it instead mm -hmm. of just with my friends. Let me share it with everyone. 
and then have someone approve it. That's a beautiful thing. And it gets the, the front desk and the other departments thinking about marketing. Mm -hmm. And frankly, uh, like one of the hotels, we found that the spa manager was an absolutely phenomenal photographer and marketer. Phenomenal. Wow. And now she has her own career in it. Nice. No, so no, anyway, so, so, so uh, and she has a cool name. I think her name is Zena. How many X's in the world do you know? Uh, <laughs> but anyway, she's going to be on our show next week. Uh, so uh, it, it, it should be a fun conversation. And like I said, I, I bought it from AppSumo, like everything, uh, years ago. And I've been using it. And it, what really is nice is ownership loves it because, they, to your point, uh, Adele, they, they can, the hotel can post stuff. But it doesn't go any farther unless the owner says, yeah, I like that. Yeah, that, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. And uh, it, it's very helpful in that sense. So cool. Well, uh, OK, so uh, let's see. Well, we'll start with Dean this time. Dean, if people want to know about the amazing world of MetaSearch and what it is that your brilliance brings to the table, where is Absolutely. it? Absolutely. So we're working on actually we're on a combination of things. One of them is on the training programs in teaching how people how to run a meta search campaign and all the ins and outs of it. And that is at basecampmeta.com. Uh, but not everybody wants to do it themselves. And so we also have the doing part of the equation. And that is we can get you hooked up with the right technology vendors and or help you run it uh, through metasearchmarketing.com. I'm really asking your help on that because I'm about ready to kick whip out the door on what client. So I'll be bugging you about that. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> uh, Adele, where is it that, that people can find you and what it is that you do? <laughs> you can find me at aspirereputationmarketing.com or email me at aspirereputation.com. And, uh, you know, if you understand that there is a fantastic relationship between your reputation, your five-star reviews, and the revenue that you have the potential to achieve. If you want to have earned media uh, versus paid for media, uh, a great way to do it is by focusing your reputation. And you may have already, you may be using some reputation tools, but you're wondering, how do I really apply this to my business? I can help you through that. And I look forward to talking to you. Is it just me or is that door behind you look like Alice Wonderland's The Door That Goes to the Rabbit? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure it's it just looks like my home. I'm just crazy. I'm waiting for the, uh, the bunny rabbit with the watch. I just. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tammy, uh, please, the world of Milestone. So you can find me, uh, milestoneinternet.com is our website. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Tammy Carlisle. Uh, I'm going to do two super quick plugs. One, uh, the HSMAI Marketing Advisory Board, which both Stuart and I are members of, had our meeting yesterday where our POV, our point of view topic, was around budget season. So oh. look for an article in the next few weeks that talks through... I mean, let's be real. There's so much insanity and it'll change on a daily basis. But we tried to, we actually did some polls and, and talked as a group about some ideas. And one of the, the questions was around, give your best tip for budget season. So hopefully cool. uh, we'll have a great article going out supporting uh, HSMA in a couple of weeks. Uh, Milestone is also doing a webinar. Um, actually, I'm doing the webinar along with one of my colleagues, Keith Brophy, who has been in the industry for years as well, on September 1st. Uh, I don't have the registration link just yet. Lauren, I'll share it with you. Send to me. I'll put it in the show notes for certain. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'll share it with you as soon as I have it. But uh, September 1st at, I believe, 10 a.m. Pacific time. And we're going to be talking about budget season, just really trying to give people some ideas and things. I mean... Let's be real. It's going to be a strange year. It's yeah. going to be different for everybody. But I think if we can give some comments and ideas and things to be thinking about to help as you go through, that's really what our goal is with the webinar. Awesome. Yeah, yeah please give me that link. I'll share it on the notes. And we'll feature next week, obviously, as well. We'll keep plugging until it comes up to the scheduled time. But when I think about asking Ben what they're doing, I feel like I'm asking Dr. Evil at the bottom <laughs> of the volcano what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ben. What's three and six up to these days? And where can they find you and all that other cool stuff? <laughs> well, Lauren, I'm glad you are. <laughs> I've got a cat you can borrow if you need to. <laughs> I've got a kid, to be honest. He makes about as much mess. I could just bring him in a little bit. 
Oh, he should have been my mascot <laughs> for one of the weeks for the show. I'm just having him talking. Uh, what are we up to? Um, yeah, it's been a busy... Uh, it's been a quite a busy couple of weeks for 3 and 6. Uh, yeah, we, we've uh, signed a few new clients, uh, which is good to see that there's movement in the market, even oh. such a turbulent time. Um, we are expanding the portfolio of services, hiring new designers and new SEO specialists with experience in the hospitality industry. Um, and yeah, uh, getting some of uh, the nuts and bolts tightened on some of the technologies that we've been talking about. Um, I look forward to shamelessly plugging them on this show when it is completed because it has been a labor of love. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with earned media, but if you'd like some paid media, <laughs> uh, there's you know, a... You know I worked with you too, so... <laughs> if you can't get paid on your own and you need to buy one, Ben's your man. Yeah. <laughs> if you just want to pay for it, if you just don't want to just pay for it, then uh, obviously there's there's some talented people on this call and uh, as part of the larger presenters. But yeah, three and six. Uh, our ethos is digital without dishonesty. Uh, trying to cut through the smoke and mirrors of the industry, and we get uh, get the relationships to a point where we there's no need to be dishonest. The results speak for themselves. I honestly believe that that when it comes to Ben and Trist, that we'll all look back and say, "I remember them when they first started," because I just see that they're just going to blow the world apart with some of the stuff they're doing. Well, I knew Dean, Adele, you. I just. I mean, Lily, you're already doing it, so I can't say it. <laughs> you just, you know, and the milestones of an institution in itself. So, I mean, it just, it's amazing to think that we get to chat like this over a regular basis and stuff. In fact, can't even begin to thank you all enough for taking mm. the time with us. Lily, speaking of taking over the world revenue management wise and dominating the space, a little bit about uh, TCRS services and uh, things up. And of course, the amazing podcast that you are consistently doing excellent in. Thank you. Uh, yes, you can find us at Total Customized Revenue Management or online tcrmservices.com where we do all things day-to-day -day revenue management with excellence. And also thinkupenterprises.com. That one's easier because that's the actual name of the business. <laughs> and, uh, there we do a bunch of uh, consulting projects, strategy alignment. If you need somebody to sit down and help you with your budget creation, that's right up our alley and, and creating multiple plans for your success. And also, since we were talking about math earlier on the show, um, on the podcast that's featured on Think Up Enterprises, if you go back to episode one, uh, there is a great exercise there that will get you started and walk you through how to define some of those metrics to figure out uh, what your longevity is with your cash flow. Being a, a willing participant in, in your podcast, uh, I can honestly say I enjoy seeing the numbers grow. I mean, your download rate is increasing persistently, which is not just a reflection of the audience size because there's a lot of listenership that doesn't download, they just play. But downloads mean I got to remember this and keep it. And that's profound that people take that up to it. You know, only if Ben had a podcast, I'm just saying. <laughs> but it, honestly, and I, and I know we've been really, really pants about getting back, but we, we're we so busy, and we're, we're not to like to a horn a minute, but I feel really vindicated in that we've chased the relationships and not the revenue. And that that approach is coming home to roost now, and we yeah. are so busy signing up new clients. I, I I I'm really happy about it. It's such a first world problem to have. Oh no, so many clients. Are so so what you're saying is you're not going to need talking to us anymore. You're going to be like, yeah, whatever. You guys have fun with that thing. Lauren, I'll be on this show until you kick me off. And <laughs> you realize like he's just faking this. He doesn't imagine what the hell is. <laughs> oh my goodness! Well. For all previous 262 episodes, including now 263, you can go to hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash live. There you will see all links and show links. And, and of course, Tammy will put the link in for your presentation and push it out when we do the rebroadcast and so forth for all that. All of the links to you all will be also on that for anybody wanting to reach directly to any of the websites of those that, that were on the show today. Uh, and even for our co-hosts that didn't make it today, it's a, you know, we have the pleasure of having a wide diversity of co-hosts that uh, whenever they can make it, it's awesome when they do. And you know, we look forward to the next time they can pop back in again. We're still missing Robert. You know, Robert's just MIA. I don't, he gives us the wonderful little list, but then he <laughs> just, you know, and he used to be the mainstay for, we were now, we're into our seventh year. We, our anniversary was last week. So we're actually rolling into our seventh year now. Uh, and he has been a part of it. He's a, he's a missed commodity. So Robert, if you ever listen to this back, miss you, buddy. Well, kind of, maybe a little. <laughs> <laughs> so with that in mind, 
Thank you also very much. Next week, as I said, we'll have a guest co-host from uh, Planable. Uh, it'll be 1130 Eastern. The, this show does get replayed, as we mentioned, uh, several times during the course of next week, live on all the platforms that you see, the LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Twitter, everything on a regular basis. Podcast also. And then um, we also rebroadcast for APAC and in the London time, Wednesdays, 1130 AM for both of those. So for those in those time zones who want to watch it back again, it'll be available then. So until next week, thank you, everyone, for participating this week. And we'll hopefully see everyone next week. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.